Hi, my name is Jacob Thornton, and I'm going to share my family story. Um, the picture you're seeing on the screen now is what my family looked like about a year and a half ago, and that's changed a little bit. I'll get to that in just a second. So I wanted to introduce sort of us and myself. I'm a cartographer, which means I make maps, and also a drummer. And my wife, her name is Janina. Um, she's a librarian. We've been married for almost four years, and our daughter, Margot, in this picture, is uh, probably three months old but she is almost two years now she'll be two in august and then just a couple months ago we welcomed this little guy to our family his name is charlie uh, he as you can see is about two months old a little older than two months now and both of my children were born severe to profoundly deaf or, or with severe to profound hearing loss i guess which in uh, sort of common terms effectively means that they are deaf. We since found out that that is because of a gene that we have called Connection 26 that we've passed down to them. Um, with Margot, it was a huge surprise, and with Charlie, it was not as much of a surprise. Um, and today, I'm going to focus on our story with Margot and kind of, you know, how that went when she was born and how it's going now, just because she's a lot older and we have a lot more experience. And that was kind of the first, you know, when she was born, that was our first introduction to this world. This was totally a shock. We didn't know anything. So I'm going to stick mostly to talking about that kid right there. That's her now, banging on some drums with her crazy hair. Um, so I'll start with how Margaret was born. First of all, my wife had this crazy thing. It's called pups that, that pregnant women get sometimes. Um, it, it's sort of rare, but definitely not unheard of. But it basically manifests itself like poison ivy. It's super itchy and just really uncomfortable. Um, so that's kind of how we went into this. And the only way to get rid of it is to have the baby. So we went in a couple days late to have Margot. Um, Jane went through 26 hours of labor. And then Margot got kind of sideways and wasn't coming out. And we ended up having to do an unplanned C-section. So it was kind of a uh, really a wild day there, or more than a day. Um, and when Margot was born, because of the surgery for the C-section and because of that pups thing, she ended up on steroids and narcotics. So it was a couple days of madness and just, you know, no sleep. And she was a bit delirious, my wife was, and we had this new baby. It was just a bit disorienting. And then when Margot was two days old, she failed her hearing screening. We were told in the hospital that this was probably not a big deal, you know, it's probably just fluid in the ears, especially with the C-section babies, nothing to worry about, and that they would test again before we left. Uh, on the third day, they tested again. The testing, this has since changed, at least in this hospital, but when Margot was born a couple years ago, the testing, they did it outside of the room. So they were, they, they did the testing in the nursery. So at three days, when Margot was three days old, they came to get her to do the hearing screening again. And this time, I just walked out with her just to kind of watch the process and see what was happening. And they had the things in her ears, and there were three nurses standing around, and they were all looking at the screen and adjusting the, the ear pieces. And after it was over, she had not passed again, but they were still saying that it was probably just fluid. And I just had this sense from watching that scene that it was a lot more than that. So we went ahead and um, you know planned to plan to check this out further as quickly as possible we were given this referral sheet by the hospital as you can see at the top it says to look into it within two years that was in the photocopy so at the time everybody that was given the sheet um, had that written at the top of their page and not only that but the facilities on the sheet several of them are closed some of them the building's not even there anymore the, major, the vast majority of them uh, see elderly patients that are getting hearing aids and that sort of thing. You know, I called most every office on this list um, before I finally found somebody that would see us. So it was kind of a, you know, not a great jump into just even figuring out what to do. I probably spent several hours calling all these numbers and trying to track somebody down. So day eight, we ended up with an appointment took Margo in and got her ABR, which is her auditory brainstem response test, a series of three tests. And we were told she was severe to profoundly, uh, she had severe to profound hearing loss. And it, it really 
I guess took a day or two in, in asking somebody else with some experience what that exactly meant and if that meant she was deaf. And of course it did. Um, but at the test that day, we basically were given some literature and told that there were amazing things they could do with technology um, for kids with hearing loss that they would be able to hear. And we basically just called our parents and drove home. Uh, at the time, we didn't know any deaf people. Um, we ended up finding a counselor on our own just because this was so shocking. We didn't know how to handle it. It was such a huge surprise. Um, so we ended up doing some counseling and really kind of grieved our expectations for this child um, just because, you know, especially being a musician and just, just all the hopes you have for your child when they're born and, and then this thing that you weren't expecting is there. Uh, you know, we were trying to figure out how to deal with that. Uh, shortly after that, we began researching our options. And one of the first things I thought when I confirmed that severe to profound hearing loss means that she's deaf, that my wife and I both agreed that we needed to start learning sign language. You know, that was kind of what we thought of when we thought of deaf people. Um, we didn't want to wait any amount of time to start communicating with our child and start teaching her to communicate. So in that process of just working through what this meant, what this, you know, how this was different from what we expected, what it was going to mean for our family, that was kind of the first action we took is just to learn some basic, you know, I love you, mom, dad, milk, that those sorts of signs. Um, diaper, I think, was one of the first ones we learned. And then we really dove into the, the huge decision making into figuring out what our communication options were in terms of hearing aids, cochlear implants, American Sign Language, um, just kind of digging through all that stuff and, and reading everything we could find. At one month, we started early intervention for Margo and had somebody coming to the house for that. Um, had a bunch of doctor's appointments, got medical advice, got um, advice from people in the deaf community. We started taking American sign language classes when Margaret was five months old and through that we're able to meet a lot of you know adult deaf people and start to ask them their opinions and um, when Margaret was three months old we found parent PCA which is parent child advocate it's a program through challenge discovery which is specifically for hearing parents of deaf kids so we started going to that and learning some signs that was great because we were able to meet other parents that were in the same you know had the same family dynamic that we found ourselves in. Um, had conversations with them. We had conversations with cochlear implant companies. Decided we thought we wanted to do that. Uh, six months, Margo had her MRI. And the next three months, <laughs> we really just agonized over which brand we were going to choose for all the you know, different bells and whistles and number of electrodes and what works better. And we ended up choosing Medell and made that decision at nine months. And then at 10 months, Margot was bilaterally implanted with cochlear implants. Um, but actually, I sort of jump ahead there. And what I want to show is even before that, as we were using sign language with her, she started responding to it, which was amazing to us because this is a totally new language. You know, as you learn a new language, you're translating in your head and it's so slow and so difficult and yet this video that I'll show you she's six months old you'll see my hand come into the screen and I'm going to show her the sign for milk and that was the sort of response we started getting um, you know when we would ask Margo, if she wanted milk, that was specific, you know, that was the first sign that I think she really understood and really meant something to her. Um, so it was just exciting to see that, wow, she's getting it. At six months, she's communicating. At seven months, she started communicating back to us. Her first sign was milk, and I am so excited to say that her second sign was dad. And then mom followed it very shortly after. So that was the seven months that we really were communicating back and forth with our child in American Sign Language. Uh, at 10 months, we took her in and did the surgery, like I said, bilaterally implanted. Um, that was a bit of a rough experience too. 
I think we just weren't quite prepared for coming out of that with the bandages and she, you know, just had a nosebleed in the middle of the night, which is just very, very upsetting. Um, we actually took her home the next night and she woke up and just kind of swollen around her eye and threw up a couple times and we ended up back in the ER um, and, and ended up coming back home that night and, and all was well. You know, I've heard other parents say kids came home and, and were just fine almost immediately. That wasn't really our experience. It you know, probably took a week for Margaret to really get back to what we felt like was normal for her. Uh, but we did make it through it, and I am happy to say that was an experience that was worth having. Um, at 11 months, her cochlears were activated. Um, some that she was turned on, but she is very active, and we were communicating. And you know, I, I don't really love the term. We're, we're going to turn her on at this um, appointment. It was more that her cochlear implants got turned on. She was already uh, fully on <laughs> at that point for sure. Uh, I counted, and over the first year, we did 63 appointments that were claimed under insurance. Now that does count some pediatrician appointments that had nothing to do with Margaret's deafness. Um, it does count some of the grief counseling that we went to, counts early intervention where they were coming to our house, uh, but still a whole lot to schedule, a lot to take in. Um, there's 52 weeks in a year, so that's 11 more appointments than one a week. So quite a bit of appointments, it's very overwhelming. Also, I wanted to show this picture when they sent us home from the hospital after Margo was, was implanted. This is what we came home with. We came home with our child and a huge amount of boxes. Um, so a ton of gear to kind of sift through and figure out what's what. Uh, you know, like I said, uh, just the whole process was a bit overwhelming. I think it just sort of becomes your life in the moment. But now to look back at it a year later, I realized that it really was a lot to deal with that first year. Um, but also very rewarding. You know, once Margot's implants were activated, she started saying mama very quickly and started making some other sounds. I know she started saying ah, and um, I remember, you know, my dad pushing her in the stroller and saying, you know, I can make sounds behind her and she repeats them to me without seeing me. I mean, that was, that was just a few weeks after her implants were turned on. So we really felt like it was working very quickly. And like I said, very rewarding. Um, she learned the sounds of our voices. We had a timer that went off when her milk was ready at that point. She knew that sound. She knew the sound of music and began to like it. Now she asks me for music regularly. I have a picture here of her picking through my record collection. This is something she sees dad do. So you can see her implants. Um, you know, she's probably a year old in this picture and uh, just copying me, picking a record and and then we put it on and pick her up and dance and she just loves it. And she still asks for that several times a week. Um, we also continued signing, you know, that, that was something that we got different advice from different people, but we decided for her identity and for communication, you know, at the beach and the bath and before her, she has her cochlears on when she wakes up in the morning and, and noisy environments. It, it just was a key thing and just a key part of her identity to sign. Um, there's a picture here of her pretty early on signing dad. You know, that, I think that was right when I got home from work and, and my wife and her walked outside and she saw me and signed dad. I'm um, just really cool and really exciting to see. And, and you know, I know this is different for everybody. We don't see that the two languages have interfered with, with each other. It's, it seems like they sort of support each other just because she had this language base um, when she started with her cochlears. At this point, she we try to keep track of the signs that she uses. And at not quite two years old, she's signed more than 200 words and she has spoken more than 100 words. And she clearly understands a lot more than that in both languages. Um, she'll answer questions in either language. Um, so it's, you know, it's just, Again, really rewarding to see that in both of our chosen communication methods, Margaret's really excelling and, and it takes a lot of dedication. Um, but it seems to be working really well and it's really exciting. And like I said, Charlie, her little brother, was also born deaf. And we, of course, are signing with him already and really, really plan to do the exact same stuff with him. We just feel like it's gone well and are happy with our choices and, um, and plan to continue. 
So in closing, I guess I um, just want to talk about a couple things that were the most helpful for us. One, I really think getting that counseling at the beginning was great for us. You know, I, I really uh, advocate for hospitals to have that on hand for doctor's offices where they do these ABRs for these parents that aren't expecting, um, you know, what they're about to, the journey that they're entering really is to have some sort of counseling to help them understand how they're getting into it. Um, and, you know, another, I guess, wish in that setting would be the equal presentation of triplers and written sign language. We really sought that out ourselves, but but it wasn't really presented in an even way at first. Um, so I hope that's something that will improve. But we did, you know, we found a great audiologist. We found a great early intervention, early intervention person. Um, we have gotten amazing help from people in the deaf community and raising our deaf child. Um, that I mentioned PCA earlier. They're here in Richmond. They have been awesome. Hands and Voices has been awesome. ASL Champs for the local Richmond Sign Language classes, just evening community classes that we've done that have been so great. Um, I do, you know, I know some states have a deaf role model for early intervention. Virginia does not have that. It's something I definitely advocate for. Um, and another thing I would say is just finding the people that work within the communication choices that you want to go with. You know, we found an audiologist that seemed to support our choices. We did some digging, really did some digging to find an early intervention person that was supportive of our choices. And I think, you know, some people feel so strongly about different communication methods that really, as a parent, the best thing you can do is make your own choice for your child and then find the people to support your choice. And we've really done that and it's been great. Our friends and family have been uh, amazing through the journey and we're just happy and excited and Mario is just the happiest kid and uh, things are going great. So for the moment, that's the end of the story. And uh, we have another one coming up, like I said, with Charlie and are excited to move forward and watch him grow too. So I hope this has been helpful and thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, like I said, hope you learned something. Thanks.